Okay, hi, I'm Professor Ormberg. We're going to review uh, our second module of the course, Partnerships. And in this module, we're going to talk about both general partnerships and limited partnerships. Uh, this builds off our first module, Agency and Respondeat Superior. And we'll remember going into it that it's important to really have that first module understood because so many agency principles are imported directly into our partnership law, and many of the concepts are similar. But we also have some statutes to deal with here. Uh, and um, just by way of introduction, my name is Professor Orenberg. I teach uh, closely held business organizations, corporations, and electronic discovery, and previously practiced corporate law in Silicon Valley. So let's get started. The law of partnerships. I'll begin by just explaining what is a uniform law. So, a uniform law is a law created by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, and it's a model law. It's not a law per se, it is a uh, law to be. And essentially these model laws are drafted by committees, and then the committee will promulgate, promote, try to advertise and, and, uh, and encourage people to adopt this, uh, to adopt this model law. And so they're not necessarily ad uh, adopted in a uniform manner. So, I mean, the famous story of Carl Llewellyn and the Uniform Commercial Code, which has almost universal adoptance, I think, everywhere except Louisiana, which is a civil state, uh, a, code, a code jurisdiction as opposed to a civil law jurisdiction, so it didn't overlay properly. But in general, uh, these laws do not get universally adopted. But for our purposes, we're going to learn the uniform law because it provides an excellent way to practice statutory analysis, but I encourage all of you, uh, when you are in your own home jurisdictions, to, of course, review your local laws, because these are general principles that do not necessarily apply in your jurisdiction. So we have a couple of laws that are going to come up today. Uh, the original Uniform Partnership Act is quite old, it's from 1914, and it was revised uh, vastly in 1997, and a large majority of states adopted RUPA, the Revised Uniform Partnership Act. This course deals with RUPA. Uh, we also have a Limited Partnership Act, which dates to 1916, which was revised in a similar uh, manner over, over a period of times. However, um, it was revised four times, and this course deals with the uh, RE-RUPA, or now just called ULPA, or OLPA, uh, from 2001, but I will caution you especially on this one that that particular statute was not adopted by a majority of states and, uh, and it has some important distinguishing principles uh, so we should um, definitely look to our local materials to make sure that they apply. So regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, the formation concepts behind partnerships are fairly straightforward and uh, and similar across the board. So it makes sense to begin with formation. How do you create a general partnership? So a general partnership is, along with sole proprietorships, which is not really an entity per se, uh, is really the only legal entity which can be formed without any specific filing. And as a result, it can be formed uh, by accident. And I would even counsel that in general, general partnerships should only be formed by accident, that most times you get an attorney involved to create a business, they're going to create one that has limited liability. The hallmark of general partnerships is unlimited liability. And uh, it's, in many ways, it has become a stopgap uh, for liability uh, and, and a way for liability to be shared across partners. So a partnership is formed when two or more persons agree to associate to carry on as co-owners a business for profit. So those are our elements and a partnership is formed when we have two or more persons agree to associate to carry on a business as co-owners for profit. So when we find those elements we have created a partnership regardless of intent. Now, while intent doesn't matter, intent to form a partnership can also show that we have created a partnership. But again, it is not required. Uh, and again, we have that, that same rule expressed here in 202. That's where we find that language. 
So here are our rules. This is 202C in the uh, RUPA uh, to determine when a partnership was created. And a couple of brief comments here. You can read this on your own. Important to read the statute closely in this particular section. Uh, profit sharing, an agreement to share profits is strongly presumptive of a partnership. However, uh, we have a new provision in the modern law which says that when those profits have to do with interest or other charges on a loan, it's one of our exceptions and does not create that presumption. So a bank lender will typically not be construed as a partner, even if that bank loan is what I would consider uh, performance-based. Performance-based loan is one where the rate or other features of the loan will change depending on how the company does, making it seem like a profit interest. Uh, and anyway, we have um, uh, you know, six exceptions here to that general presumption. So co-owners are different from mere agents. And in addition to having our agency principles, which underlie and undergird all of this, we also have some additional principles that govern partnerships specifically. Um, passive co-ownership of property does not by itself establish a partnership. Uh, it's the co-ownership that are directed toward a business end. And most notably, a for-profit business end. So in this case, a not-for-profit adventure seems that it would not qualify as creating a general partnership by statute. Now, of course, you can file to create a partnership. And so we're just here talking about the default of when a partnership is sort of formed uh, accidentally. Uh, joint ventures are only partnerships if they otherwise fit the definition. Just by virtue of creating a joint venture does not by itself create a partnership. And a limited partnership is not a partnership under this definition. But a limited partnership is brought into the definition by the Limited Partnership Act itself. So OPA makes a limited partnership a general partnership, a type of general partnership. You can think of a limited partnership as a sort of special subset. In addition to the liability that arises when a partnership is formed, there is one exclusive and unique way for partners, uh, well, I should say for purported partners to become liable for a partnership that does not actually exist. So even if a partnership is not formed, you should also consider or always consider in the alternative whether or not there is a partnership by estoppel. This concept of partnership by estoppel is covered in RUPA 308, which actually talks about liability of a purported partner, which is a very similar concept. The idea here is a person is not really a partner, but we're going to hold them to the liability of a partner. Why? Well, it is meant to protect people who rely on those representations of partnership. So even if the partnership was not actually formed under our rules of construction, we have our stopgap with our estoppel concept. It's a somewhat detailed uh, statute here, so there's a few other issues there. But the, the upshot is a few things. First, there's no duty of denial. So you don't have to go around the world telling everybody that such and such is not your partner. Right? Your liability for a partnership uh, is limited to whether you actually consent to, to the partnership. An otherwise innocent person is not liable as a partner for failure to deny his partnership status as asserted by a third person in a statement of partnership authority. And a partner's liability as a partner does not continue after disassociation solely because of failure to file a statement of disassociation. Again, the estoppel concept could pertain not only to a partnership that never existed, but one that no longer exists. And at the end of this lecture, we'll talk about disassociation, winding up, and termination. Only persons who are partners as among themselves are liable as parties, uh, partners to third parties for the obligations of the partnership, except liabilities incurred by purported partners. So let's talk a little bit about partnerships and what they are. The concept here is, are they, are they their own separate thing? Are partnerships something that exists in the world as a separate entity, or are they simply a combination of people? The, uh, the law was originally characterized by the aggregate theory. The aggregate theory is outdated. 
we have moved into the entity theory of partnerships in almost all jurisdictions. And certainly for the purpose of this course and for our, our revised Uniform Partnership Act, we have an entity theory. An entity theory treats the partnership as a distinct entity. I have an example here. So this is my, uh, this is my Star Wars theory of partnerships. So you'll remember that in Star Wars, uh, Luke Skywalker had his arm cut off by Darth Vader at the end of the second episode, right, and had it replaced. Now, after that, Luke Skywalker remained Luke Skywalker. Simply by virtue of a piece of him, a component of him being changed, did not change his basic characteristics, right? And so here is, this is like the entity theory. We imagine there's an entity called Luke Skywalker. There's something essential about it. But there is a limit to this rule. And so moving on to the other side of the ledger here, we have uh, Anakin Skywalker's chest, Darth Vader. And here he is. Uh, in, this is from the, the newer series, right? And he lost, I think, three of his limbs and was replaced by a machine and essentially changed his identity. So my question to you here would be, would Darth Vader, let's say that people owed Anakin Skywalker money. Aside from the fact that Darth Vader would probably be able to collect on whatever debts he felt he was owed and probably then some, you know, the question here is would Darth Vader have the legal authority to collect on Anakin Skywalker's debts? And it resembles the aggregate theory. It seems like he lost so much of himself in that altercation that he became a different person and as a result had uh, uh, different rights. Uh, he was no longer he was no longer Anakin Skywalker. He became Darth Vader. And so we do have a entity theory in general for our partnerships, right? Very clearly stated, an entity is dis an entity distinct from its partnerships, and so we would expect it to continue even as partners cycle through, right? Partners will leave, partners will come, you know, and we can think of them as comprising a body. But at the same time, that body can be made of uh, either the original partners can all leave, a complete new set of partners can come in, and in general, the partnership will remain and still maintain its legal rights, its ability to collect on its debts, etc. There is uh, a reason for this. Uh, the reason is that it, it adds stability, and so people that are contracting with partnerships know what they're getting, which is always helpful. And it uh, simplifies our analysis. We no longer have to think you know, how many partners left? Is it enough for the entity to cease to exist? Right? We're going to consider Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader the same person in our, in our entity model. Um, this has uh, consequences in criminal law, which are interesting for those who are involved in, uh, in that subject. Uh, but more to our point, there are some exceptions, at least there seem to be. So even though uh, we have this entity theory, we have at least one case where, uh, you know, maybe our Darth Vader case, you know, our case where a person changes their entire character and physical body and mindset and name or what have you. Similarly, a partnership may change so much it runs the risk of being treated as a different organization. But this is really the exception to the rule, right? The entity theory is pretty strong, and so this is an exception to the rule and potentially even an outlier or a, a very unique uh, case, but there is, that, there is that case that is good law. Okay, authority. So in order for any business organization to uh, take action, in order for any agent or partner in a business organization to take action, they need to have authority to do so. Where does authority come from in a partnership? In a partnership, a general partnership, partners have both actual and apparent authority to conduct the usual business of the partnership. The usual business. So here again, a couple other ways to put it. Acts within the ordinary course the usual business, going about the business. The partners themselves are the source of authority. But remember, this is an entity theory. So the source of authority comes from the partners, but it is the partnership that is the one that is actually making the action. So when the partners act on behalf of the partnership, you can almost maybe mentally picture you have your partners down here, you have your partnership up here. And the partners grant the authority to the partnership. They are the ones the authority comes from. But the partnership then has the power to act, and then each individual partner then receives back uh, the ability to act and bind the corporation, the partnership within its ordinary course. Right. So the the um, the partners by themselves, if they were acting alone, uh, you, you just it, you need to think of it as the the power going to the partnership and then going back down to the partners as partners, because partners are different 
than shareholders in a corporation and to a certain extent, you know, some types of members and some LLCs. But in a corporation, you have a separation of ownership and control. The shareholders of a corporation do not control the company except for some small voting rights. But here in a partnership, you have this combination of ownership and control. So the partner is an agent of the partnership. So agency law applies. So that's why we did that module first, right? So those agency principles come about, and we have an agent, but we also have a partner. And they have dual responsibilities, dual obligations, dual powers. Uh, and so their agency, what is the scope of their agency? Whenever you think about agency, you need to think about the scope. It's to bind the company within its ordinary course, uh, or apparently for carrying on in the ordinary course. Uh, in contrast, an act of a partner, which is not uh, for carrying on in the ordinary course, binds the partnership only if it was authorized by the other partners. So partners can take actions that are extraordinary. And so, for example, you have a cleaning company. The cleaning company uh, cleans you know, linens. So you have a, you know, drives a truck, goes and picks up linens, takes it to a central location, washes them, folds them, returns them. Acts within the ordinary course would include things like putting gas in the vehicle, purchasing detergent, you know, uh, making calls to customers. But how about selling the delivery truck? That might be something outside of the ordinary course. So we need to think about whether that act would be authorized. And part of it, again, relates to that concept of authority. You see a partner, you know that they're in a business, and they offer to sell you their truck. At that point, is it reasonable for you to assume that they can do that? that they can bind the partnership in the sale of that truck? Or what about a sale of the entire partnership? Can one partner sell the entire partnership? Usually not. So there's this gray area. If you're selling, you know, if they're, if they're buying detergent from you and they're a linen company, it's a partner, almost certainly safe that they are going to be bound, the partnership will be bound. And they're selling the truck that they need to conduct their operations and all you have is one partner who seems interested, Maybe at that point you're getting a little sketchy in terms of whether it's reasonable for you to believe that's authorized. And then selling the whole business, it would not be reasonable to believe that's authorized just when one partner comes to you. So we have to look at things that are within the uh, ordinary scope. I summarize it this way. A partner may bind partnerships to third parties unless the matter is outside the ordinary course, in which case you would need unanimous consent of the partners or however the partnership agreement provides. Uh, now, again, there's this concept of a statement of partnership authority where you can file a document which either expressly gives or retracts power uh, for a certain partner. And so if a statement of authority was filed and either gives or retracts power, that statement provides notice to the world. And so it can uh, change that general rule. Um, or if the third party had actual knowledge of limited authority, you know, the partnership calls up and says, look, uh, this particular partner is running amok, and you know he's trying to sell all of our vehicles, and that's just not that's not acceptable to the rest of us, and that's really an extraordinary matter. You just you can't contract with him. A notice like that would also be sufficient. So we have kind of two ways of giving notice. One is this concept of a of a statement of authority, a statement of partnership authority, and this is a filing that you would make with the state. Right? We talked a little bit about those various filings, and another is actually providing notice. So here's your test for apparent authority. So that was actual authority. Now apparent authority, we have a two-step test to determine if a partner has apparent authority. And again, we go back to the usual course. The first step is the partner purporting to bind the partnership. Uh, is he carrying on the partnership business in the usual way? Usually the inquiry stops there. If the linen company is buying detergent, it really, you know, you pretty much have apparent authority there. But if the person is doing something a little bit unusual, that puts you on sort of notice that you need to inquire further. And then does the third party uh, purporting to contract with the partnership know or should have known the partner lacks actual authority? So it's a little bit of like a burden shifting kind of idea. So you want to go through these two exercises. But remember that if the act is extraordinary or involves a sale of the business and there are some statutory items that we will cover, uh, those would not be authorized acts and they will not bind the partnership. So courts are reluctant to interpret authority of partners in a way that gives partners a veto right over the business. So you can see how potentially 
this idea about lacking authority for extraordinary matters means that a partner might go out and try to sell their truck. And then a month later, turns out that the price of trucks increased. I mean, real estate is probably a better example, right? I mean, trucks typically don't increase dramatically in price. But in any event, you sell an asset, and then later you find out that that asset has increased in price. You want to rescind the transaction. So you go, well, you know, we really uh, sent that partner out. Uh, he went rogue. Uh, that was not something that bound the company. We have to rescind that transaction. Courts really disfavor that sort of gamesmanship. And so there's a general principle that courts will be reluctant to interpret authority in a way that gives them sort of this veto right. Again, imposing the cost to partners over third parties. Uh, if a majority of partners improperly resolve a partnership with a uh, dispute with a third party, uh, the dissenting partners have a remedy against the majority and the partnership. So here, let's say three out of three out of seven partners want to sell all their trucks. The other four don't. Uh, the three that want to do it just do it. So what happens now? Well, the courts may be reluctant to rescind that transaction. We'll have to look at the facts here, but the buyer of those trucks may have gotten a good deal, and uh, and the courts may say, look, it's not clear if that action was sort of in order to get a, a veto right or an option, sort of a put option on those trucks, uh, sell them back to us. And so what is the remedy here? Well, the partners that were wrong could sue the other partners. But here we impose the liability within the partnership as opposed to on the third party. So hand in hand with authority is the question of control. Who actually controls a partnership? Well, it depends. Uh, we have a, a number of rights and duties. I'll point you to J. Sometimes partners disagree. You have three partners, and some might say, you know, going back to our laundry example, you know, two say let's buy Tide, and one says let's buy uh, Dawn. Yeah, I don't know if that's a detergent. Okay, Kirkland brand, right? Uh, or let's say none of them agree. You have three partners, they all want to get a different brand of detergent. One wants low end detergent, one wants medium grade detergent, one wants high end detergent whatever. So this is a matter in the ordinary course. And so what happens when there's a dispute? Well, it needs to be resolved by a majority of the partners. Again, these are default rules, meaning that the partnership agreement can specify otherwise. Yeah. But uh, so you have a dispute in the ordinary course. What detergent should we buy? You know, we buy detergent all the time. Result, need a majority opinion. Uh, an act outside the ordinary course requires consent of all the partners. Should we sell all the trucks in the business? Should we change from doing laundry to doing taxes? You know, ma something major, something extraordinary would require a unanimous vote as a default rule. So here I've restated that concept. Ordinary decisions require majority. Extraordinary decisions require unanimity. And you'll remember that a partner acting alone can bind the company in the ordinary course. So if there's no dispute. A partner can just run around and do anything that revolves the ordinary course. But they cannot do things that involve the extraordinary. And if there is a dispute, if it regards ordinary things, majority, extraordinary things, unanimity. So partnerships being entities can own property. They can own property in the partnership name. And this is consistent with our entity theory. So, you know, I invite you to think about what would partnership ownership look like in an aggregate theory? Like, who would act if, if the partnership is just an aggregate, not its own separate thing? Who owns partnership property? But that's not the world that we're living in. We're living in the entity theory world. We're living in the, the uh, Luke Skywalker world of partnerships, right? And so the partnership has a name. It, that name uh, can have record title of property. Uh, we need to determine when par uh, property is uh, property of the partnership and when it is property of the individuals. And similar to our concept of the power going up to the partnership and back down to the partners, the property also goes up to the partnership and then goes back down to the partners. So what do the partners actually own? The partners own an interest in the partnership. They don't own a piece of the partnership party, uh, property. Okay, let's say the partnership owns Blackacre. Uh, you know, I mean, do the partners each get a piece of Blackacre? No, they each get a piece of the partnership. And that's important and distinct because that changes their ability to use Blackacre, for example. Since they don't have rights to a third of Blackacre, they have rights to a third of the partnership. So we have some tests to determine 
Uh, when part property is partnership property, I suggest you read 204. But we have a couple general rules and a couple rebuttable presumptions. The general rule is that uh, if property is acquired in the name of the partnership or with the intent to title transfer to the partnership, it is property of the partnership. So uh, let's say Professor Orenberg is in a partnership and I receive a, you know, a sales contract to purchase a vehicle to go about company business, a Ford F-150. I go to the Ford store, get my $40,000 Ford F-150, and the bottom is a signature line. Now I can sign that document in a number of ways. I can sign it with my name, or I could sign it as a partner. And that makes an important difference. If I sign it, Professor Orenberg, partner, Orenberg partnership, right? That creates a different legal effect than if I just sign it with my own name. However, if I sign it with my own name with the intent to title, transfer title, we have something that uh, we presume is partnership property. And at the bottom C and D, we have two rebuttable presumptions. If property is purchased with partnership assets, so I don't use my credit card, I use my Chase business card, you know, or the plum card, or whatever, uh, instead of my Amex, and I use the assets of the partnership but I sign it in my own name, we have now a rebuttable presumption that this is partnership property. On the other hand, if I purchase without any indication of my position as a partner, right? I go and I get the truck and I don't mention anything about the partnership to the Ford dealership and I don't put anything about the partnership on the documents and I pay for it with my own personal credit card and I write my own name on it, there's a rebuttable presumption that that's my personal property. So a little summary on that. So partnerships can own property, and that has to do with their nature as being aggregates. We'll talk briefly about partnership accounting. Just two quick slides on this. Not a major topic in this course, but a few things you should know. Uh, partnerships have something called capital accounts. Partners are also the investors in the company. right? They capitalize the company. And when they capitalize the company, they don't get shares like you would if you capitalized a corporation. You buy shares in a corporation. You can also take out a loan. We already learned that the bank who gives the loan is not construed as a partner. So the partners, what do they give to be members of the partnership? Well, they often contribute their own assets. And as the partnership makes money, they may be entitled to a share of profits. And those go into a ledger called the capital account. A default rule is that each partner has an equal right to profits and equal liability for losses. Again, it's a default rule. So you may want to have a different structure if one partner is the money and one partner is the labor. In fact, you may want a different structure. Maybe if one partner is the money and one's the labor, you want a limited partnership. Right? But here we're in general partnerships, and this is a default rule. Importantly, distributions do not happen automatically. So the, the partnership makes money. It has its own separate bank account. It has its own separate entity status. And then this money is sitting out there. What happens with it? Well, the partners have to decide when to distribute it. But as I mentioned earlier, right, partners get a K-1, employees get a W-2, independent contractors get a 1099, all these different tax documents. Now, what differentiates the K-1 from the 1099 and the W-2 is the 1099 and the W-2 reflects money that was actually paid to you. Whereas the K-1 will show your share of the profits, whether or not they're distributed. What does this mean? It means that you may be having a tax liability without having cash to pay it. It's a concept called phantom tax. And so partnerships need a way to sort this out because some partners who have deeper pockets may want to reinvest that profit into the partnership, and others may need that money to pay their tax bill. And so a partner can incur tax liability without receiving a distribution because of a concept called phantom tax. This is true of limited liability companies as well. Uh, as limited partnerships. So, as I mentioned, uh, partners are both agents of the partnership and they are fiduciaries to each other. So, going back to our previous module, we have a number of duties of loyalty and performance that agents owe to principals, and those apply, but we also have fiduciary duties of partners. And they are a smaller subset, but they're important to know here. The duty of loyalty first means that a partnership holds as a trustee any profit interest obtained from essentially partnership property. 
The partners have a duty to refrain from acting adversely to the partnership, and they have a duty to refrain from competing with the partnership prior to its dissolution. And I'll remind you now, and we'll cover it later, that dissolution is only the first step in the conclusion of a partnership. After dissolution is a period called winding up, and it ends in termination. So partners can compete with a partnership while that partnership exists, before it's terminated, but after it's dissolved. And there's only one duty of care. There's only one additional duty of care that partners owe to each other, and that duty is uh, to refrain from engaging in grossly negligent, reckless conduct, or intentional violations of the law. So what about good faith? How does good faith come into this? Well, it didn't say there was a duty of good faith. And the way I read this is there's not a duty of good faith, but there is an obligation of good faith. I'm not entirely clear what's the difference between a duty and an obligation. And you may not be either. But I think here's the way to think about it, is that all agreements have an implied duty of fair dealing and good faith. That's an implied obligation in every contract. Now, the partnership agreement does not necessarily have a contract affiliated with it, but I think the same principle has been inserted into the law by statute. So this duty of good faith and fair dealing that's found in every contract is also found in every partnership relationship because there is this obligation of good faith and fair dealing although it is something different from a duty of care and a duty of loyalty. And another way to think about this is the duty of care and the duty of loyalty has an implied obligation of good faith and fair dealing built into it. So it's not an additional duty, but in order to uh, not breach your duties of care and loyalty, you must act with good faith and fair dealing. Okay, so we have quite a few issues regarding the general standards of a partner's conduct, and so that's in section 404. I'll let you read that on your own time. I've summarized it for you here. The duties of care and loyalty are not waivable, but they can be limited. So while they cannot be expressly waived, the partnership can make its own determinations about how to calculate those duties. And so in this way, the partnership can effectively limit the duties uh, and the other thing that is interesting here, uh, and we see this different in different kinds of agency law, right? we saw that an agent who uses the property of a principal, the example here was someone watching someone's horses and made money by renting them out to be ridden, right? they had to uh, discharge that money to the principal. They were liable for it. Here, it's even stronger. The uh, partners are trustees. So any money that they put into their pocket is essentially not their money. So it would be even easier to obtain that money uh, from them in that context. OK, um, I'll quickly uh, move through one last section for, for today, liabilities of a partnership for the activities of a partner. And so these concepts are not so dissimilar from respondeat superior. Uh, let the master answer. Uh, a partnership is liable for loss or injury caused to a person when a partner acts in the ordinary course or with authority. And this makes sense because, remember, a partner can bind a corporation in the ordinary course or if they have an express grant of authority to take that action. And so actions that fall within that same ambit can result in liability to the partnership. A partnership is liable for injury results from the ordinary course. And these circumstances are construed broadly. So we have a real broad view about what that means. And a partnership can be liable for a partnership acting intentionally as well, similar to our agency principle that a principal can be responsible for the intentional torts of an agent. Uh, the concept here is joint and several liability. So this comes up in many legal contexts, but just to review briefly, joint and several liability means any or all, which means that a person can sue either the partnership or any partner or all of the partners or the partners and the partnership. And there is a certain procedure that has to be gone through in order to uh, obtain a judgment. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, whereas uh, joint means you could either sue all the members or the partnership. Now you can sue any or all. Uh, Section 305 imposes strict liability on a partnership for misappropriation of money or property received by a partner in the course of a partnership business. So if a partner goes out and, uh, you know, let's say, is supposed to enter into an insurance contract with, with you, and instead of actually using that money, puts it in their pocket, the partnership would be strictly liable for that offense. We just finished discussing 
liabilities of a partnership for obligations of a partner. Now we're inverting that and we're talking about partner's liability. So a, one thing about partner liability to remember is that new partners, when they become admitted to a partnership, are liable only for new obligations as of when they were admitted. So there are a couple dates to mark when a person's admitted to a partnership and their obligations for uh, obligations, their own obligations for obligations of the partnership uh, are for new ones that have accrued after they become a partner. So, I mean, one question to think about is why is that fair? And one answer to that may be it's fair because why should you be liable for debts uh, that you may not have been aware of or um, and you may be joining a partnership uh, and there was some misrepresentation on the other part of the partner, so this rule is a bit of a fail-safe there. 307, partners can sue each other. Uh, we do know that partnerships can also sue and be sued, and we have joint and several liabilities. So we discussed earlier that joint and several liability means you can sue any or all of the partnership and the partners, and because partnerships have an entity theory, not the old aggregate theory from the 1914 standard, but the newer uh, all the newer statutes consider partnerships to be an entity. Uh, a partnership may therefore be able to sue and be sued in its own name, and an action may be brought against the partnership uh, in its own name, uh, not inconsistent with uh, Section 306, which is liability of partners. Now, here's a couple important things to remember procedurally when litigating with a partnership. So we have joint and several liability which means that we can sue any of the partners, all of the partners, the partnership, or all of the above. All or some, any or all. But whether you name the partners in the suit will have some implications as to what are your post-judgment remedies. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So an action can be brought against the partnership and the partners do not need to be named. It's not necessary. And this simplifies and streamlines litigation. But a judgment against the partnership is not by itself a judgment against the partners. So when you have a judgment against the partnership and not against the partners, and the judgment cannot be satisfied by the partnership, you then would look to the partners to satisfy the obligation. A judgment against a partnership may not be satisfied from a partner's own individual assets, even though, remember, these are general partnerships, so these partners are going to be liable for the debts and obligations and torts of this partnership, but you can't reach into their pocket unless there's a judgment against the partner, and we have a few exceptions. A partner must be therefore named individually and served in an action against the partnership or potentially in a later or different suit before their personal assets can be levied as judgment. A judgment creditor of a partner may not levy execution against the assets of the partner to satisfy a judgment based on the claim against the partnership unless the, par uh, unless the partner is personally liable. Uh, this requires partnership creditors to exhaust the partnership's assets first. So creditors have to go and get the assets of the partnership first before they go after the assets of the partner unless they have a much more complex suit where they name the partners individually and even if they do so, we do have this statute uh, in most jurisdictions that says the partner will not be, have to pay the claim unless they're personally liable. So we get into some, you know, tricky issues about when a general partner is personally liable. Uh, they're not, they do not enjoy limited liability, but there is some amount of um, emphasis on going after the partnership first. So partners have that limited amount of protection. And this makes partners have a, a slightly different relationship. I would describe this as the, the partners essentially guarantee the partnership. So when you guarantee someone else's debt, when they can't pay it, the creditor can come and collect from you. And similarly, if the partnership cannot pay the debt, the partners effectively are guarantors on all of the partnership's debts. And so if the partnership can't pay, the partners are there, therefore subject to pay. Okay. Now, there are five exceptions to when a partner can have their own assets levied as a result of a judgment against the partnership. And the first one is like we discussed when the judgment has not been satisfied, right? And then the guarantors step up and they have to meet the obligations. If the partner is a debtor in bankruptcy, bankruptcy is a long and convoluted process and the results for creditors are uncertain. So in a bankruptcy proceeding, 
you can you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go directly to the partner's pockets. Uh, if the partners agree the creditor cannot, does not need to exhaust the partnership assets, essentially like co-signing uh, in a personal capacity, for example, a court can grant permission, and uh, there's also independent contracts which can create that result. The essence of this, two quotes from Gilden versus Simon. Uh, one, a plaintiff need not sue the partnership as a precondition for proceeding against the partner. This is because nothing in the statute requires the plaintiff to sue the partnership in addition to the individual partner. Idea here, joint and several liability. You don't have to sue the partnership. You can sue who you want to sue. That's what joint and several liability gives the uh, tort feeser or the creditor the right to do. Uh, the, tort, the tort claimant. The exhaustion re requirement does not diminish the scope of a partner's liability or immunize a partner from suit when a plaintiff cannot or does not join the partnership, but it does restrict those post-judgment remedies we just discussed. Okay, so moving on to disassociation and dissolution. Disassociation is when a partner leaves a partnership. Dissolution is when a partnership begins the process, but does not end the process of ceasing to exist, and that process is the process of winding up, resulting in a termination or liquidation. There are 10 events that can cause a disassociation, and another six that can cause dissolution and winding up. You'll see that they are uh, somewhat similar. So on our disassociation side of the ledger, these are ways a partner can leave a partnership. How can a partner leave a partnership? One is notice. An agreed event can happen. When you get paid three times your investment, you're out. Okay. Agreed expulsion, all the other partners throw out the partner. Unanimous expulsion, uh, oh, sorry, agreed expulsion would be like a majority under certain conditions. And unanimous expulsion is when everybody but that partner rejects that partner. Judicial expulsion is when a court orders the partner to be kicked out. And so that's usually on motion or on application. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, bankruptcy of a partner can result in them being disassociated. And then uh, we have four different sections, which are really one concept, which are different ways that different types of entities, when they cease to exist or can no longer function, no longer get to be part of a partnership. So when we talk about a natural person, we would talk about death. We don't talk about with a corporation. We would talk about uh, you know, if a, if a corporation, let's say, loses its charter and can no longer operate. Uh, uh, and is otherwise sort of incapacitated or a business entity is otherwise terminated. On the other side of the ledger, looking at dis dissolution and winding up, uh, there is a concept of rightful dissolution at will. Partners can decide to end the company, similar to the notice concept on the other side of the ledger. The term could be complete, similar to an agreed event. The company has fulfilled its purpose and no longer will exist. There could be an event that triggers it. Everyone got paid back three times their investment. The company no longer needs to persist. Uh, the business could become unlawful. The business becomes unlawful. I give the example here, for example, you know, one of the risky issues here, what about medical marijuana of dubious lawfulness or legality? You know, we have other issues like that, which could potentially cause a disillusion and winding up. Uh, a judicial determination uh, on, on uh, application by a partner or a judicial determination on application by a transferee. Yes. Uh, so, rightful, we talk about a wrongful disassociation when a partner leaves the partnership. A partner does not have to stay in a partnership. And this is similar to the concept that an employee can always leave a place of employment. But it doesn't mean there are ramifications for doing so. So, if a partner wrongfully disassociates from a partnership, they lose certain rights that they would otherwise have under this section of the statute to receive certain compensation. Okay, so a business concept I'll introduce briefly. We'll talk about it in module four, the business concepts module. But remember that upon a dissolution or disassociation, one of those rights that's triggered upon the disassociation might be the right to be paid a share of the partnership. And when the partnership is dissolved, it has some sort of value which is distributed to the partners. How do we determine that value? Valuation is the art and science of determining what an ongoing business is worth without actually Going to the market and selling it, how do you determine what something is worth? There are a number of methods to do this. They're fairly complex, and there are entire you know, MBA-level courses on this subject. But 
uh, a couple of those concepts that are on there. You can look at the value of just what is everything if you sold it at auction. That's a salvage value. You can look at uh, how what is the book value of the assets, which is not going to be accurate because book value reflects an accounting concept, not necessarily real world value of things. You can look at comparable companies and see what they have been bought and sold for. And as a result, sort of like going and looking at houses, the house next door is worth X, the house next door is worth Y. You take the average, you think this house is worth Z, the comparables. You can also look at the time value of money of future income streams, a more complicated concept we'll talk about in module four. One thing which is particularly difficult to value is goodwill, and goodwill is an intangible Right? There are many intangibles a business have. We talk about intellectual property as one broad category of intangibles. And then we have this other category of intangibles called goodwill, which is sort of the everything else. It's the residual. Once you've taken all of the tangible assets, and once you've taken all of the intangible uh, re, you know, intellectual property, all the patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, everything that could be transferable, there is something inherently untransferable about an ongoing business that would be destroyed if that business ceased to exist. And those are considered goodwill. Again, concepts from module four, but they come up in disassociation and disillusion because we need to value these companies. A reminder again, mentioned this a few times, a partnership continues after dissolution. What happens after dissolution? After dissolution is the process of winding up that results in termination. So dissolution is an instantaneous event. It happens in an instant, at a very particular moment in time. Right? If you had the email, the paper trail, the smoking gun, you could say at you know, April 14th at 11.50 uh, AM, the partnership was dissolved. But then the process of winding up could take several months because you need to distribute assets, you need to pay creditors, you need to perform valuations. You might have some disputes and arbitration and potentially litigation needs to be resolved, resulting in termination. But after dissolution, the partnership cannot continue going about its business. So after that critical instant in time, the only business of that partnership is the business of winding up. So after the dissolution happens, a partner who is not wrongfully disassociated, that wrongful disassociate, again, a, a concept we talked about is a, uh, a way that a person might lose certain rights. But a person who is not wrongfully disassociated may participate in winding up the partnership's business. And by the way, they may be compensated separately for doing so. Or partners may order judicial supervision of the winding up. Sometimes the disassociation happens, the disillusion happens, because there was a lack of trust. Something had gone wrong. It may not be at that point efficacious for the partnership to wind up its own affairs. Courts sometimes step in. So uh, procedurally, there will be a statement of dissolution that will be filed. After the partnership has begun the dissolution process, what liabilities may be incurred? The liabilities that may be incurred are liabilities that result out of the winding up process. So Section 804, which I didn't put up, basically says partners have the right to bind the partnership after dissolution for the purpose of winding up the partnership. And 806 says the partners are joint and severally liable for the uh, torts and uh, debts that arise during that process. So let's move on to limited partnerships. And limited partnerships can potentially be understood through the lens of a sort of subset of a general partnership. They're very similar to general partnerships in a couple important ways. Uh, one is that they are governed by a very similar set of default rules, but we introduce a new character to our story. And so we're building. We started with agency law in module one. We understood agency law and respondeat superior. We saw how general partnerships relied on not only agency principles, but added principles of partnership on top of that, because partners are agents of a partnership, and they're also partners. So we have that additional building block there. And now we're going to build on top of that, and we're going to add a new cast, a new cast member to our set of characters, the limited partner. The limited partner act came about in a similar time as the general partner act, but it has really evolved over time. And Unlike 
the General Partner Act. The Limited Partner Act that is the most current is not widely adopted. So basically we have four acts and over time the evolution, the, of course many things changed, but I think the most critical part that changed in the first place, a limited partner originally would lose their limited liability if they participated in anything constituting control of the business. Now the second revision, the first revision in 76, uh, but if the exercise is not the same, if the exercise of that control is not the same as the, what the general partners did, the LP is liable only to third parties with actual knowledge. But the most significant amendments which were adopted by most states and what you'll find in most jurisdictions today is that limited partners are liable only to persons who reasonably believe the limited partner is a general partner. This concept is very similar to the concept of apparent authority because it has to do with a reasonable belief in the third person. And so we asked, does that third person have a reasonable belief this person is a general partner? If so, no limited liability. In some modern jurisdictions, 19 states, including this state, Florida, the LP, the limited partner, is never personally liable, regardless of entering into the management of the, of the company. So when you review your case law, know that that is a moving part. So look at the date of the case, because it will inform what type of jurisdiction you're under. So becoming a partner in a general partnership versus a limited partnership is very similar, except that there is one way you can become a general partner, that you cannot become a limited partner. You cannot become a limited partner, but you can become a general partner uh, following disassociation of the limited partnership's last general partner. A limited partner does not have the right to bind the partnership. And as such, is not an agent of the partnership unless there is some kind of apparent authority that cloaks them. But as a default rule, the limited partners have no actual authority. They may not bind the partnership, which is distinct from the general partner. In return for that lack of authority to bind, they receive a lack of liability. They have uh, no liability for limited partnership obligations. Now, this model statute, take a look. Which of those four stages in the evolution of the LP law does this seem like it came from? Let's look at the key language. Even if the limited partner participates in the management and control of the limited partnership. What does that tell you? This is Florida. This is one of those modern statutes one of those 19 modern statutes, this is not found in every jurisdiction. This is found in a minority of jurisdictions. But we do have it here in Florida. Okay. Limited partners do have certain information rights, and the law has tried to balance this. On the one hand, you don't want someone who has no rights to control poking around in all the meetings, inspecting every book and every record, and being a nudnik. But on the other hand, uh, these investors have a right to protect themselves by making sure that the general partners are deploying their investment appropriately. So there are some limited rights to access information, and the law categorizes them into two different concepts, required information and other information. And so required information can be accessed freely, but they have to show cause to access other information. And as we remember, limited partners also have the right to compete with the partnership. So think about things like the customer list. So if the general partnership has a particularly valuable piece of trade secret, would that go under the required information or the other information? Can you see how showing that to limited partners who could then use it to compete because they have no duties to do otherwise could potentially harm the partnership? So unlike general partners who have duties and obligations, which makes sharing certain information with them less potentially harmful, Sharing information with those LPs could actually be harmful. So it is important to balance those equities. OK, limited duties of limited partners. Essentially, limited partners don't have a duty of good faith, uh, don't have a duty of, I'm sorry, strike that. Limited partners don't have a, uh, a duty of care, a duty of loyalty. But they do have an obligation of good faith and fair dealing. Remember that partnerships are formed by contract. Limited partners enter into this by contract, and that concept of good faith and fair dealing, which permeates contract law, is also going to be very relevant and found here in the LP context. A limited partner does not violate a duty or obligation under this act. 
or under the partnership agreement merely because the limited partner furthers the limited partner's own interest, whereas that could be a breach for a general partner. Each general partner is an agent. We discussed that. And we look at both actual and apparent authority to determine whether or not a general partner binds a partnership. An act of a general partner which is not apparently for carrying on in the ordinary course the limited partnerships activities or activities of the kind carried on by the limited partner is, uh, binds the partnership only if it was actually authorized by the other parties. So we again have that important distinction which ran through our general partnership law between acts in the ordinary course and extraordinary events. And as a third party, do you have a reasonable belief that a general partner is able to, without having authority, uh, contract with you for an extraordinary event? No, you do not. That reasonable belief does not exist. So the apparent authority that cloaks that general partner does not cloak them so much that a third person, you, would have a reasonable belief that they can engage in an extraordinary event, like a sale of the company, or going back to the example of the dry cleaning, maybe the sale of their own their only delivery truck, you know, by the side of the, what have you. But for buying laundry detergent or gasoline in the ordinary course of operating that business, it would be reasonable for that third party to have that belief. A limited partner is liable for loss or injury caused to a person as a as a result of a wrongful act or omission of a general partner arising in the general in the ordinary course. So again, the limited partnership, not the limited partner, the limited partnership is liable for the acts of the general partners. Again, very similar to our respondee at superior theory, right? We learned in module one that the acts of the agent can result in liability to the principal. And here we have an agent, a specific type of agent, a general partner. They commit a certain type of act in the ordinary course that binds or is a tort committed in the ordinary course, and as a result, we have liability to the partnership, but not to the limited partners. What kind of liability do GPs have? They have joint and several liability. You can sue any and all of them. So just like you'd sue any or all of the partners and the partnership in a general partnership, you can do that with general partners in a limited partnership as well. And we have that same concept of accrual of liabilities. In addition to creating LPs, limited partnerships, the statute often creates LLLPs. LLLPs are another unique type of entity. They're a separate type of entity. They are distinct from limited partnerships in that LLLPs have general partners that are not personally liable. This is somewhat of a bridge to our LLC concept we'll talk about in Module 3. These are not a very common form of entity, but, and there are many other sort of unique entities that come up, but this is one of them that is created usually by the limited partnership statute, the limited liability, limited partnership. So general partners can be joined in the action. We learned about the joint and several liability of general partners. And a judgment against a limited partnership, this is similar again to our general partnership rule, but an action and a judgment against a limited partnership is not by itself a judgment against the general partner. A judgment against a limited partnership may not be satisfied from the general partnership's asset unless there's also a judgment from the general partner. And we have similar exceptions, five reasons why, same five reasons, right, we just learned about. Again here, the theme is that the GP is more of a guarantor of the debts and obligations of the partnership. And while there is joint and several liability, if you don't exercise that joint and several liability by naming that partner and suing them and winning, winning against that GP separately, then your recourse is to collect from the partnership. And if the partnership cannot, at that point, pay its debts, then you can go after the guarantor, or bankruptcy, or judge order, et cetera. GPs have management rights. They play a commanding role. They're the managers of this organization. And the default is that decisions in the extraordinary course are made by a majority of them. So remember that LPs have no control rights. So who would bind the company in the case of an extraordinary event? Well, a majority of the GPs could. 
remembering that the GPs owe fiduciary duties to the LPs. So the LPs might have a cause of action against the GPs. The consent of each partner is necessary to amend the partnership agreement. And here I believe this means all, I hear I, I think all means all, meaning also limited partners, right? To amend the partnership agreement because the partnership agreement may very well contain rights of the limited partners. And it wouldn't be fair for those, rate, those rights to be waived or amended away without their consent uh, to amend the certificate of limited partnership to uh, I uh, had a delete a statement that it's an LLLP. Why is this important? Again, uh, LLLPs, the GP is not liable. The LPs in, an, in, an, in a limited partnership, the limited partners in a limited partnership may be unhappy about that result. They may want the GP to be liable. So the GP cannot just automatically make himself not liable without the consent of the limited partners by filing as an LLLP. Or to sell, lease, exchange, or otherwise dispose of all or substantially all of the partnership's property with or without the goodwill other than in the usual course and regular course of the partnership's activities. So again, if it's the usual course of the partnership to buy land and sell that land, the general partners can do that on their own. But can the general partners just completely end the business and liquidate it without the permission of the limited partners? No. No. We would need the consent of each partner, which includes the LPs. All right, uh, last concepts here, uh, sort of just kind of small ideas here. Uh, C and D on uh, section 406 regard loans. So a limited partnership shall reimburse a general partner for payments made and indemnify a partner for liabilities incurred and shall reimburse them for any advances made. And those constitute loans and they accrue interest. So if the GP puts out their own cash to finance a debt or, uh, or otherwise uh, incurs a liability that is indemnifiable, then that money is considered a loan. It was, is repaid with interest. And I think most notably on this slide, uh, the GP is not an employee. And this is important because if you're an employee, you would have to be paid. In America, we have minimum wage. And so if you're an employee, you must be paid at least that wage. A general partner is not entitled to remuneration. Now, of course, in many partnership agreements, the GP is going to be compensated. Why else are they doing this? But they're not employees. And as a result, their compensation is only by virtue of contract and not by entitlement under law. All right, let's look at a couple of our cases. Again, we're going to go through these just briefly to remind you what they were. Uh, Martin versus Payton was about GP formation when GPs are formed. Uh, fairway development discussed the entity theory as opposed to the old aggregate theory. R&R &R investments uh, introduced us to the know your partner rule, which related to authority of general partners. Here the general partner did something bad and he had authority to do it. Uh, Owens versus Monaco Lands, this is another uh, GP authority case. This one helped us to understand that very important concept of what's in the ordinary course and what's extraordinary. Very fact specific. Here was kind of an outside case where they disposed a huge amount of the property, yet it was in the ordinary course. Summers versus Dooley are two trash collectors. Uh, this had to do with control and authority. Meinhard versus Solomon, a case actually about joint ventures and one that's often found in corporations textbooks. But it's, a, uh, it's an old case that discusses the concept of fiduciary duties. And we have that phrase, that punctilio of honor that they owe to each other. Morin versus Jack's uh, restaurants was about partner liability. Here we had an injury as a result of a dough press. Uh, and there was some negligence by a partner. Did that result in liability to the partnership? It did. Bauer versus Bloomfield, partnership interests. Interest meaning what are they uh, owed? Can they be transferred? We had a dissent there. Uh, we talked about valuation in two cases, Drashner versus Sorensen and Warnick versus Warnick. A lot of these closely held cases have the same last name, right? Gotham Partners had to do with management of a limited partnership. Complicated fact pattern there. Good one to review carefully if you want to understand some of the finer points of transfer agreements. Uh, we had a reverse split, a unit option plan, and an odd lot tender offer. Fairly complex from a technical standpoint, useful for learning some of the technical details. And that is it for 
limited partnerships. So thank you, that's module two, and we'll reconvene for module three, limited liability companies.